Good afternoon, Family Chapel. Uh, welcome to our live stream. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, glad you are with us here today. Well, today we're going to be starting uh, our service uh, with our call to worship. Um, and just in light of everything that's going on right now, and uh, just the injustice that we face in the world, and the anger and pain that many are feeling, um, we want to acknowledge that. And uh, in this time, as we come before the Lord with all these emotions, processing all these different things, um, we come before God um, and to once again turn to Him and to see His hope and His glory once again. And so at this time, we're going to have our call to worship. So could you rise with me as we hear God's word, as He speaks to us, His people, and welcomes him, us in to praise Him. The call to worship comes from Psalm 9, verse 9 to 11. And it says this, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord, who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Amen. And as we come before our Lord today, we come before our God who does not forsake the weak, who does not turn his back away from the needy and from the oppressed. But no, we have a God who sympathizes with us, a God whose heart goes towards the broken, whose heart is for the lost. And he invites us to trust in him to place our faith in Him as our stronghold, as our defense. And so now as God invites you, as God invites us, for those of us who feel broken, who feel tired, for who, those of us who feel hopeless, would you turn once again to our God who invites you to come and to rest in Him today. So at this time, let's prepare our hearts for worship as we place our faith in our God together. And Lord, we come to you today heavy-hearted, heavy-hearted as we see the injustice around us, heavy-hearted as we see the pain that many face, face on a daily basis, heavy-hearted as we see just, yeah, just the effects of sin upon our world. And oh Lord, our world, we cry out for justice now, and we need a great hope. And, oh Lord, we are reminded today, my Father, that our hope is found in you alone. Oh Lord, we are reminded today that the one who has said that, who has, yeah, who is justice, who will bring justice into this world, the only one is you. And so, Lord, today we cry out that, oh Lord, that you would show your presence once more. We cry out to you in hope and in faith, O oh Lord. And O oh Lord, we thank you, Father, that you are for us. That, O oh Lord, that you do not turn your back to the needy. O oh Lord, we thank you that you are one who turns your face to those who seek you. And so, O oh Lord, we seek you today and we want to praise you once more as we are reminded of the truth of your word. So we thank you, O oh Lord, for who you are. Would you be honored today? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our great and mighty Savior, there's no one higher than you. Cause you are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence, astounded by your mercy and love. Our hands are lifted high in surrender. Your grace for me is always enough.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. In Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still.
Diving into God's Word together. We are uh, continuing our series looking at thriving with the various arenas of life. And so far, we've looked at thriving with spiritual health. And last week, we looked at thriving with our emotional health. Well, for today, we'll be looking at thriving with our physical health. 
Uh, now, in light of recent events, um, you know, I've been contemplating all, all week long for these past few days whether or not to actually change uh, today's scheduled sermon. Um, but I've realized that a healthy biblical theology of the body actually speaks powerfully to what's been taking place. And having a robust framework of the body will actually help us to not just process what's happening, but to also rightly respond to what's been taking place these past few days. And so please do stick around um, as we go through what the Bible has to say about our bodies. And at the end of the sermon, I'm, I'm aiming to help make some of these connections a little bit more clear and explicit. And so hopefully this sermon will be helpful, not just for you in your personal life, but in light of everything that's been happening this past week and these past few days. Um, and, you know, as you know, uh, we live in a very confusing world when it comes to our bodies because every day we are bombarded with messages about the human body, messages that are often contradictory and ultimately not very conducive to thriving with our physical health, right? Like, on the one hand, we're often told that the human body is everything, right? In many ways, our culture is obsessed with the human body. We're constantly blasted with images of the human body in movies and TV shows and advertisements that implicitly and sometimes explicitly communicate that your worth, your value, your identity is found in your appearance. It's found in your waist size. It's found in your body fat percentage. It's found in your skin tone. And so, you know, we may buy into that message and find ourselves also obsessed with the human body. But that's an unhealthy approach to the human body. Well, on the other hand, though, we're also told that the human body is not that important and not that determinative of reality. For example, social media, which is prevalent, which is everywhere, which all of us are impacted by on a daily basis, social media is designed to give you an entire existence apart from your physical body. We're not bound to the limitations of our physical being. Right? We can apply filters to our faces. We can put forth a carefully curated image of ourselves, even though it's not accurate of who we actually are. In fact, there's an entire industry that seeks to undermine our sense of being embodied through something called augmented reality. And some people believe that in just a few short decades, we will be living in an AR world where we'll be walking around actual streets, no longer seeing people's actual bodies, but their avatars. And in all this, the implicit message being communicated is that our human bodies don't really have much bearing on who we are or in how we present ourselves to the rest of the world. We live in a very confused world when it comes to understanding our bodies. So we need some wisdom here. We need a biblical understanding of our bodies. You see, a, a healthy approach to our bodies requires a healthy theology of our bodies. And so what does Scripture have to say about our bodies? Right? What does the Bible have to say about thriving with our physical health? Well, that's what we're hoping to explore in our sermon for today. And in today's sermon, we'll be looking at four key points in what the Bible has to say about our bodies. And from those four key points, we'll be drawing out an implication to help us to thrive with our physical health. Right? We'll be seeing four key observations. And from those four key observations, we'll be uh, deriving four key applications. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a biblical theology of the body. And the first key point that we see all throughout Scripture is that, number one, God created us as embodied creatures. God created us as embodied creatures. God has intentionally designed us and formed us to have physical bodies. Now, we can't take that for granted. Remember, God is spirit. He doesn't have a, a physical body. And he could have easily created us in the same way as floating spirits, as disembodied souls. But he doesn't. Rather, he creates us as embodied creatures. And we see his good design in this. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see God create the, the physical universe, the physical world with physical skies and physical trees and physical animals and physical human beings. And with each act of physical creation, God declares that it is good. Our bodies are incredibly good gifts from God that have been masterfully crafted. And we really get the sense of this in passages like Psalm 139, 
verses 13 to 14. And here, David praises God for fearfully and wonderfully forming him in his mother's womb. All right, take a look. David says to God in Psalm 139, For you, God, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. See, God has intentionally and marvelously formed our physical bodies. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Even a quick Google search will blow your mind at just how amazing our physical bodies actually are. There's such intricate complexities to how our nervous system, to how our muscles, to how our organs all work together. There's such intricate complexities to how our bodies function, even at the cellular level. I mean, come on, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Our bodies are a testament to God's ingenuity and purposeful design in creating us as embodied creatures. We are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. And as such, every body matters. Regardless of race, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of ability, regardless of socioeconomic status, because every body is fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's an important thing to understand because even as Christians, we can have this assumption that the body is not that important. It's just an outer shell that contains what is truly important, a.k.a. our souls. And so after we die, we leave behind our bodies and we float around as free spirits in heaven. But that could not be further from what the Bible actually says about our bodies. See, far from being unwanted sacks of flesh that we have to drag along here while we're on earth, the body is a precious gift from God, a good gift from God. See, he has created us as embodied creatures. And so here's the implied application that helps us to thrive with our physical health. If God has created us as embodied creatures, then here's the application. We need to be good stewards of our bodies. We need to be good stewards of our bodies. Our our bodies are precious gifts from God, and as such, we need to take care of our bodies. See, when we refuse to take care of our bodies, we are actually dishonoring our Creator. We need to be good stewards of our bodies. So what does this entail? How how can we be good stewards of our bodies? Well, it's essentially what our doctors ask us to do every time we go in for a checkup. Have you been regularly exercising? Have you been getting enough sleep? Have you been eating healthy? This isn't rocket science, and I think we all know this, but it's a matter of putting these things into practice. And maybe to provide some encouragement, uh, maybe I can just briefly share about getting some regular exercise. Now, full disclosure, I am a hypocrite when it comes to this. I I do not regularly exercise as much as I should, but but I'm working on it, right? But but just take this, you know, from me, even uh, regardless. See, our bodies were designed to move, to exert energy, to exert labor. And that's been the case for for much of human history. See, for much of human history, the nature of work required you to be active. If you're a farmer, you are working 12 hours a day out in the field, moving your body. For much of human history, that's just been the, the, the given of life. You are, you are automatically active. But today, we live in a very sedentary age where many of us find ourselves sitting on our chairs for 8 to 10 hours every day, only to then sit on the couch for another 3 to 4 hours the rest of the day. But we were made to move. And so setting aside time to regularly exercise, to move our bodies, to exert energy and physical labor is an important aspect of embracing our embodied humanity. And the benefits of physical fitness cannot be ignored. I can cite research paper after research paper to show you the benefits of physical fitness. See, research shows that walking for just 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a half an hour a day, improves cardiovascular and pulmonary health. It reduces the risk of hypertension and stroke. It improves your immune system. And not just that, so much research indicates that regular physical exercise improves overall mental health. Physical exercise actually leads to having more mental energy, more mental stamina, more creativity. It leads to overall happiness. 
Now, even though we know all this, we may still have a hard time doing all this. We may have a hard time taking the very first step because it feels so daunting. But here's the thing. You don't have to set out to do 100 push-ups right away. You don't have to set out to run a mile under seven minutes right away. But you can start off small. Right? Start with 10 push-ups. Start with walking for 10 minutes. Start with a few sit-ups. Start with a few jumping jacks. Right? Start off small. Just take the first step. And if you need some encouragement, our InReach ministry is actually planning to have some Zoom workout sessions coming up. Thank you, Eugene. All right, so be on the lookout for that. But God has created us as embodied creatures. And so when our muscles and our lungs and our immune systems are in good shape, we're actually better prepared to glorify God with our bodies. And so we should seek to be good stewards of our bodies. See, that's the first point that we see here. All right, the second thing that we see in our biblical theology of the body, number two, is that sin has impacted our bodies. Sin has impacted our physical bodies. See, while our bodies were originally created to be good and are still inherently good, we bear the effects of sin on our bodies. See, sin doesn't just affect our souls, but sin also affects our bodies. And we see this early on in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. See, after God creates Adam and Eve and he sets them in, in the garden to enjoy the bounty of that creation, Adam and Eve sin against God. And in their sinful rebellion against God, they are cursed. And the curse of sin impacts everything, including their bodies. All right, take a look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. God tells Adam and Eve the impact of sin on their bodies, and he tells them here, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. See, just like the rest of creation, the body has also been impacted by sin. And you don't need to look very far to see the effects of sin on our bodies. I mean, just think back to puberty. I don't know about you, but those were some very dark times. But more seriously, right, sin produces suffering in our bodies. We get sick, we experience disease, our health deteriorates, we become weak, we die. And we feel the physical, literal weight of sin each day in our aching bones, in our sore backs, in our diminishing eyesight, in our tense necks. In a very real sense, our bodies are wasting away. And that brings us to a second application that helps us to thrive with our physical health. If that's true, then number two, we should not look to our bodies as an ultimate source of our self-worth. We should not look to our bodies as an ultimate source of our self-worth. Our bodies, because they are wasting away, are not reliable sources for our ultimate sense of self-esteem or identity or, or value. And this is an important thing to, to be mindful of in our culture that is so obsessed with our physical appearance. See, so much of this idolatry of the human body is driven by the underlying belief that the human body is all that there is. We are merely material creatures. The physical is all that matters because the physical is all that there is. And with death constantly looming on the horizon, with death constantly knocking at our door, there is an almost obsessive compulsion to cling to our youth and vitality for as long as possible. That's the reason why people well into their 50s and 60s and 70s keep injecting their faces with Botox. That's the reason why health crazes and diet fads are constantly cycling through. One year, it's, it's all about Atkins. Then a few years later, it's all about paleo. Then it's all about keto. Then it's all about Whole30. And in a few more years, it'll all be about something else. And there's just this overwhelming obsession with making the physical body what we look like the source of our self-worth, identity, and value. And oftentimes, we, we also buy into this framework of looking to our bodies for validation, just like the rest of the world. And unfortunately, because we do that, we struggle with body image issues. And we struggle with body image issues because when we look at our bodies, our bodies don't look like the photoshopped images that we see on the screen. Hey, we don't have the six-pack abs. We don't have the thigh gap. We don't have the symmetrical face structure. We don't have the even skin tone. And we find ourselves filled with negative, self-loathing thoughts. 
We find ourselves taking on dangerous eating disorders, starving ourselves just to shed a few more pounds. We find ourselves spending more money than we can actually afford on certain beauty products to make us look a certain way. But to place the weight of our self-worth and identity and value on our outer appearance is a fool's errand. Our physical bodies are wasting away. And one day, unless Jesus returns before then, we will all return to dust. The reality is that sin has impacted our bodies. And so we should not look to our bodies as an ultimate source of our self-worth. That's the second point that we see here. All right, so we've seen so far that God created us as embodied creatures, and that's a good thing. But sin has left its mark on our bodies, and that's the painful reality we find ourselves in. But that now leads us to the third key point in our biblical theology of the body. And number three is that Christ has redeemed not just our souls, but also our bodies. Christ has redeemed not just our souls, but also our bodies. See, when we think of the gospel, we tend to think of Jesus dying on the cross to pay the punishment for our sins, to restore us back into right relationship with God the Father. And amen, can there be any better news than that? I think not. But the gospel doesn't just involve the redemption of our souls, but it also involves the redemption of our bodies as well. See, Christ, the Son of God, took on all of humanity, including a human body, to redeem all of humanity, including our human bodies. And that might seem like a minor aspect of the gospel. But friends, it is a hugely important thing to the finished work of Christ on the cross. He redeems not just our souls, but also our bodies. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Now, while the immediate context of this passage is referring to battling against sexual temptations and sexual immorality, I think this passage shows us that Christ has gone to the cross to pay the ransom for our bodies as well. All right, look at verses 19 to 20. Paul writes this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. See, in in a stunning statement, the Apostle Paul calls on us to glorify God with our bodies because Christ has redeemed not just our souls, but also our bodies. Our bodies do not belong to us. We are not our own, but we belong to Christ. And that's a very different narrative from the predominant Western culture that we find ourselves in. Our culture tells us that our bodies belong to us. And as long as I don't do anything to harm another person, I am free to do with my body whatever I want to do. I can consume whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. But a healthy theology of the body reminds us that actually our bodies don't belong to us. Our bodies belong to Jesus. See, Jesus doesn't just have my heart. He has my hands my arms, my feet, my legs, my heart, my lungs, my eyes, my mouth, my stomach. He has all of me. And that leads us to a very important application. Application number three is this. If that is true, then we are to use our bodies in service to Christ. We are to use our bodies in service to Christ. If our bodies belong to Jesus, then we are to use our bodies for Jesus. Or as the Apostle Paul put it elsewhere, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to him. Or to put it differently, the way that we serve Christ is not apart from our bodies, but directly through our bodies. See, when God saves us, he doesn't free us from our bodies but he leaves us in our bodies. The Christian life, Christian growth, Christian ministry, all of those things happen in the context of our bodies. You and I, we cannot worship God apart from using our bodies. You and I, we cannot love our neighbors apart from using our bodies. See, our bodies are tools to be used for God's kingdom purposes. And so we use our lips to speak words of truth and encouragement to the people that are around us. We use our hands to do good, honorable work, 
to feed the hungry mouths that are around us. We use our arms to offer a warm embrace. We use our eyes to cry alongside those who are suffering. We use our feet to carry forth the good news of the gospel. We lift up our voices in worship to Christ. We do good things, good kingdom work with our bodies. And on the flip side, we seek to avoid doing evil with our bodies. And so we shield our eyes from watching inappropriate things online. We protect our brains and our lungs by refusing to consume certain substances. We cover our mouths from speaking words of hatred. We refrain from using our hands to carry out acts of injustice. See, through the gospel, Christ has redeemed not just our souls, but also our bodies. And so if our bodies belong to Christ, then we should seek to use our bodies in service to Christ. That's the third thing. So that brings us now to the fourth and final point in our biblical theology of the body. And lastly, number four, is that we have the hope of bodily resurrection. We have the hope of bodily resurrection. One day, for those who are in Christ, we will get to experience the fullness of Christ's redemption in our bodily resurrection. We have the guaranteed hope that death does not have the final word because we have the guaranteed hope of resurrection. All right, take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 57, as we see this final point in our biblical theology of the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, and what a glorious saying this is, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a glorious hope we have. Friends, if you are in Christ, we have the hope of bodily resurrection. On that day when Jesus blows the final trumpet and all is finally said and done, we will be made new. And as part of that resurrection experience, we will receive new bodies. What our hearts and our souls have experienced now in being made alive, our bodies will also experience on that day. Our bodies will also be transformed. Now, I don't know if that means all of us will all of a sudden have six-pack abs or 2% body fat. I'm not sure. I don't know if that's important. But our resurrection bodies will take on an imperishable quality. And for the very first time, we will experience complete wholeness. We will be made whole. And that leads us to the final application of our biblical theology of the body. We are to look forward to being made whole. We are to look forward to being made whole. See, while we find ourselves living in a sin-stained world, in our sin-stained bodies, we will always experience a level of brokenness. All of us experience some degree of physical ailment and pain and limitation. And if, and if it's not that noticeable to you right now, just, just give it some time. Right? Not to call them older or anything, but just talk to any of our older FC members and they will tell you that their bodies are not what they used to be. But rather than falling into despair, rather than lamenting about missing out on the days of our youth, rather than looking backwards, we can look forward to being made whole. And this is especially the case for those of us who wrestle with real limitations to our bodies because of real health complications. We have hope for the day when we will enjoy our bodies as they were always meant to be enjoyed, free from discomfort, free from pain, free from diabetes, free from cancer, free from the weight of sin. Our great hope is that we will be made whole, soul and body, in the presence of our God, 
that when we are raised to newness and fullness of life in our resurrection bodies, we will be able to fully do what we were made to do, to love God and to love one another. And I love what this person named Johnny Erickson Tada has said about the first thing she'll do when she receives her resurrection body. Now, for those of you who don't know who Johnny Erickson Tada is, she is a Christian woman who powerfully leads in the arena of disability ministry. See, when she was 18 years old, full of life, she suffered a tragic diving accident that left her a quadriplegic. With that accident, she no longer had use of any of her four limbs, and she was now confined to life in a wheelchair. Now, those first few years after the accident were incredibly difficult and dark for Johnny. And she has shared very openly how often and how close she has gotten to contemplating suicide. But there, trapped in the midst of her paralyzed body, she began to experience a depth of God's presence a depth of God's love, a depth of God's care and grace like never before. And rather than looking back to all of the would-haves and could-haves and should-haves, she began to look forward, look forward to being made whole. And 50 years later, as she now wrestles with cancer and as she realizes that there may not be many more years left for her, the hope of bodily resurrection is an even clearer reality for her. But what's amazing to me is that as she thinks about finally being able to get out of her wheelchair, more than doing somersaults, more than walking along the beach, more than going swimming, more than doing all the things that she was deprived of for the past 50 years, the first thing she says that she wants to do when she is finally free and out of her wheelchair, the first thing that she wants to do is to kneel in the presence of her Savior. She will be fully whole and fully living her bodily life. See, the greatest hope of bodily resurrection is not that we can have our metabolism back. It's not that we can be physically fit again or that we can finally do all the things that we can no longer do. But the greatest hope and joy of having a resurrection body is that we can now finally be whole in the presence of our Savior. We can finally, fully live life in our bodies as we were meant to do all along. And that hope gives us perspective. That hope gives us perseverance as we live life here and now in our broken bodies. We have the hope of bodily resurrection. And so we can look forward to the day when we will finally and fully be made whole. Right, so in our sermon today, we've seen a short biblical theology of the body and some of the applications of that biblical theology. And hopefully that's been helpful for you to apply in your own personal life. But hopefully you've also been able to make some connections to what's been happening in our world right now. See, we need a robust and biblically grounded worldview now more than ever. And here's where a biblical theology of the body comes in. You see, a biblical theology of the body helps us to lament. It helps us to lament the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others. It helps us to lament because we recognize that their bodies have also been fearfully and wonderfully made. That every DNA strand in every cell of their bodies has been carefully and lovingly crafted by our Heavenly Father. And because that is true, black lives matter. Black bodies matter, and we should mourn and lament their deaths. See, a biblical theology of the body also helps us to feel righteous indignation and anger at the sin of racism. Racism which lifts up a physical bodily attribute as the ultimate source of someone's identity or self-worth or right to life. It helps us to feel a righteous anger when the sin of racism takes root in people's heart. When the sin of racism is entrenched in our nation's history. When the sin of racism is culturally entrapped in our nation's institutions. We can rightfully recoil at the unjust taking of precious bodies. See, a biblical theology of the body also challenges us to not stay apathetic, 
but to wisely and lovingly use our bodies in service to Christ, namely, in acting in love towards those around us, namely, in listening to those who are hurting, Namely, in speaking up for those who have no voice to speak up. Namely, in holding our governmental authorities accountable. Namely, in pursuing to create a society that is more just and more safe for all people. And lastly, a biblical theology of the body helps us to not lose heart. I don't know about you, but the predominant emotion that I have been feeling these past few days has not actually been anger. But the predominant emotion that I have been feeling these past few days have been a deep pessimism. How many times have we seen the the same videos and the same images shown on the television screens again and again and again? How many times have names been trending on Twitter for the wrong reasons again and again and again? How many times have both sides of the conversation just been shouting at each other with no one ever listening again and again and again? Just my wife and I sat on the couch Friday night, Thursday night, Saturday night, looking at the news, watching our city burn in places. I just felt a sense of despair and hopelessness. Will any of this ever change? Will things ever get better? But yesterday night, as a good handful of us gathered to pray, and thank you, Timmy, thank you, Kat, for organizing this. As a good handful of us gathered to pray, my heart and my eyes were again directed to the one who promises true justice and true peace because he has gone to the cross to pay the punishment for our sins. And as I were directed once again to fix my heart and my eyes to Christ, I felt a renewed sense of hope in the certainty that Jesus is coming back. And when he returns, we will finally experience the wholeness our bodies have been aching for. Friends, I hope you can see what's been happening, not primarily as a political issue, but as a gospel issue. See, the gospel speaks powerfully into the tragedy and the anger and the hurt that we've been witnessing these past few days. And in seeing all this through the lens of the gospel, I hope that we as the church can be salt and light in such a dark and divided time that we as the church would bear the aroma of Christ, that we as the church would be the very body of Christ. See, thriving with physical health touches upon all of life. And like the rest of this thriving series, thriving with physical health is ultimately found in being rooted in Christ. The essence of thriving with our physical health is not found in having a low body fat percentage. It's not found in having good cholesterol numbers or being able to bench press 300 pounds. But no, the essence of thriving with our physical health is being rooted in Christ. And and there, as we are rooted in Christ, we are able to be good stewards of our bodies so that they would be of good use for God's kingdom purposes. And that begins with being rooted in Christ. And so Family Chapel... In light of Christ, in light of the gospel, may we steward our bodies well. Jesus has paid the highest price to redeem our bodies. And in light of that, may we seek to use our bodies as vehicles to bring God glory. As we love him and as we love our neighbors using our bodies. If you can bow your heads with me at this time. Spend some time in prayer and reflection as we respond to God's word together. And as you reflect on your body, would you again be reminded that your body is not your own, but it has been entrusted to you as a gift by your heavenly Father and redeemed for you by the work of our Lord and Savior. And as such, would you take this time to once again Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Would you pray, take my hands, Lord, my feet, my eyes, my mouth, my brain, my arms, my legs, my ears, my lungs. Take all of me in service to you and your kingdom. 
Let's take a moment to respond to God in prayer. Let's pray together at this time.